Welcome to the first episode of Industries in Transition, Meet the CSO. The role of the CSO has changed dramatically as the world moves much more towards accelerating to net zero. We at Standard Chartered are very pleased to be bringing you this series as we will be introducing CSOs across various industries and having them talk about their personal journeys and some of the challenges that they're facing. I'm very pleased to introduce our first guest, Dr. Steve Howard, Chief Sustainability Officer at Tomasic. Steve has been in sustainability over a long period of time, working with Tomasic most recently, and prior to that with IKEA as the Chief Sustainability Officer. What drives your interest in this space and why have you spent so much time on it? It's fascinating and it just gets more interesting as uh, with time, sort of new horizons open all the time. It's not like you've been working on the same thing for 30 years. The finance sector tends to be hyper-rational, but everybody has a heart. We all have ethics, we all have values. Nature's this gift to us that's fabulous. And sustainability is the interface of, uh, of modern life with nature. How has sustainability evolved over the time period that, in, 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 and when you've been working in it? If I go back to when I started working on this, really in, in the, the 90s, um, then the global economy was a lot smaller. Things like solar were absolutely nascent technologies. Renewables were almost nowhere. And now you can see it's a tremendous growth sector. There's a war for talent for people with even just one, two, three years experience of sustainability. As people have realized this is a mega trend. So that's a big shift. Now people say, okay, this is about how we live. It's about our shared future. It's an existential threat, climate change. And the business and finance community have woken up in a way that's incredible, really. And I would say that's, that's the last five years. So Steve, you've done quite a bit of work, either working together with NGOs or founding them. What could private corporations take away from some of the work that you've done you know, with NGOs? Most NGOs have clarity of purpose and they have clarity of outcome. Business community can, can engage much more on that. So how do you align your culture, your values, your business model, your strategy, your products and services, the way you treat your customers and your suppliers with your purpose? So the NGO communities may be better around that alignment and there's some, some models there. In Tamasek, you know, we've refreshed our purpose and our purpose is so every generation prospers. These purpose statements can be something you really cascade into how you run the organization and how you make decisions. And as an investor, you can say, is this company, is this investment uh, consistent with that purpose? When you think about you know, your role as the Chief Sustainability Officer at Tamasic, um, how do you help guide you know, the investment process around companies that you might be thinking about? ESG is about risk management, fundamentally. This is about long-term trends that will be with us the rest of our lives, so like digitization, the demographic shifts, and looking at sustainability as a megatrend and climate within that. When you put that as a layer, and then all of our investment teams in different markets, in different sectors, understand what does sustainability mean to them in that market and their sector, and then adapt and develop that to strategies. And then you look into opportunities. What does the future look like? How do we unlock opportunities? And investors get excited by that as well. So I would say we've come a long way in, in time a sec, and people are dialed into, into this now, and whether it's food and ag looking at plant-based foods or micro-irrigation, or it's into looking at the, the energy transition or looking at new industrials, sustainable materials, at uh, e-mobility opportunities. We're really sort of uh, hunting the future now. How do you use your role as an equity partner or as a shareholder to help shape the sustainability agenda of these portfolio companies? We're looking long term, deeply strategically at how do you uh, build a more sustainable future? How do you tackle climate change? Um, and that values alignment's important because the entrepreneurs I've met in this space, and that's many of them, they have two ob objectives. You know, yes, they want to build a fabulous business and make money along the way, but they're solving a problem. That can be decarbonizing cement or creating great alternative proteins to feed people without having environmental impacts. They don't just want an investor in the boardroom with them who's just interested in making money three years down the line or something. They want people who are equally invested in that outcome, who understand the space and who are there with them on that journey. 
Tomasic has been, I think, a, a, on the forefront of developing quite a few platforms, whether it's CIX or the decarbonization platform together with BlackRock. Talk to a, a little bit about the platforms themselves, but also the role that I think partnerships are creating, you know, mm -hmm. in this environment and how we need to come together. There's a real need for helping scale and commercialize businesses and that complements, you know, we do some sort of early stage technology investing and BlackRock's got this huge global reach and connectivity and we thought we can do something different together where we combine those skills, the if we take the best of both firms and put it together and raise third party capital alongside that. And that's when these sort of collaborations and partnerships come together, um, the market recognizes that. The entrepreneurs who are raising money next, decarbonization entrepreneurs, um, they're really interested in, in this new specialist firm that's been set up. Steve, I wonder if we could also talk a little bit around CIX or the Climate Impact Exchange that Standard Chartered is very pleased to be part of as well. Well, how, how do you think about that? It's a fantastic example of collaboration and it's definitely one thing where having you know, Standard Chartered, DBS and uh, SGX and ourselves come together uh, to say how do we cr help create a high trust carbon market? The carbon market can make solving climate change much more efficient at lower cost. So the impact exchange is there to actually have those a marketplace and auctions where you can see uh, high quality carbon and it's be highly traceable. You'll see all the different projects it comes from, whether it's technology driven or nature driven and having our combined capabilities come together to support the development of, of a new business enterprise there, you're brought together by common purpose because for, for, for Standard Charter or for us, it's a commercial venture this, but we're not, our commercial success will not be defined by it, so we want it to be successful. We want to onboard other collaborators, other shareholders who are going to lean in and help make this into a real global marketplace. We need more collaborations like that where you're brought together by how do we solve for the future together. I think you're absolutely right. This is the space where we have to be able to co-collaborate uh, and co-create in, in, in helping this to really become something that we can shape as, as a collective. One maybe final thought on these things as well. The, and it's, it's a, maybe it's a message for the, the CSO community. Towards the end of my time in IKEA, Ingvar Kamprad was, he was 92, the founder. He came, gave a spontaneous speech to our, our senior management. Um, and he said, we're not failing enough. I want more failures. And everybody was shocked. And this is because business actually likes to manage out risk taking. In a fast changing world, um, we, we can't stay safe. We have to take some risks. We have to back bold pilot projects, bold technologies. Things like Climate Impact Exchange come together and say, we're going we're to roll up our sleeves and get this stuff done. So uh, take a risk for the future as well. You invest across sectors. How do you and your team build up the expertise to guide industries across the transition? You need to understand what's, what's a real sustainability outcome and the difference between something that's, that's not really contributing and something that's really helping future-proof products, services and businesses. We need everybody to skill up in the organization look at what does it mean in your job, in your part of the organization. You need to understand what does sustainability mean if you're, a, if you're an investor in the transport scheme or if you're working with portfolio companies on a specific level. That's the important thing because there's so many dimensions to this. This is not learning something for you know, the sake of it. This is about learning the future of your sector. It's about the future of your job. So um, it's, it's like being digitally literate. If you couldn't use a computer at all, you, you, you're shut out of business life. So you need to be able to access this. How is the portfolio performing against that criteria and how do you evolve the ESG criteria in terms of evaluating some of the investments that you've made? When we have a, a, a sort of sustainability council for, our, for portfolio companies where we come and we share best practices, we do deep dives on what does climate change mean for the executive team of, or, and the boards? This is a shift that we're seeing now as capital markets realize you know, that net zero is the right outcome in this huge sea change that we've seen, um, that everybody realizes actually my investors are with me rather than against me. And there's more risk standing still than moving forwards. We're clear that we're going to halve our portfolio emissions by 2030. We know where those emissions are. We have a deep dialogue with all of the companies. They know where their emissions are. And um, we see huge alignment with people putting strategies and plans in place. 
And then lastly, it's looking at where do we see an opportunity working with a company to help them expand or help them access new technology. There's value in everybody for that. It can help a growth company that you've, that you've invested in and it can help a very big business around that. We think about the amount of money that's required to go into the transition and getting the money where it needs to go, yet also not disabling the economies as they are still in a development phase. Are we doing this the right way? Is there a, a better way for us to accelerate this? This is a problem which you need good government policy and incentives with business innovation and investment. For some of this, you need public capital to help de-risk some blended finance in the, in the middle of this. And that's particularly for going into sort of helping with the energy transition, access to energy in the, uh, the poorer developing countries where actual private capital struggles to get there. The good news is, and I'm so grateful for this, is it's a solvable problem. So we may have left it a little late, uh, and uh, the window of opportunity is not, not wide open. But whether it's renewable energy, electric vehicles, battery storage, alternative proteins, improved efficiency, the new hydrogen economy, we have a full suite of solutions. Uh, some of them we need to get to real economies of scale. Government can help on the innovation piece. And it was no coincidence that here in, in Singapore, the first cell-based chicken was sold. And that was because government gave it fast approval. And in other markets, Governments can take years to do that, and that can be the death of an entrepreneur and the death of a technology. Now we have to look forwards because if it's, if it's with technological capabilities, so we know solar is going to be another 50, 60, 70% cheaper by the end of this decade. So we should plan and our assumptions are around, actually, yes, we've got panels that are more efficient and we've got those economics down the line and we design policy and investment decisions towards that. Do you have three takeaways that you're walking away from this conference on in terms of what you would want to share? I think nothing is out of the question now. And you could say a lesson from the pandemic has been that we can mobilize ourselves in extraordinary ways uh, when we have to. We're in a climate emergency. It's like a pandemic that will just get worse and worse and worse, uh, even with our best efforts. So we need to respond in that way to it. If you'd asked me a few years ago, I would have thought some things are gonna be really hard to do, but I can see you know, the energy sectors being transformed. Mobility, I'm just struck. So new vehicle sales last year, a little more than 8% were, were EVs. The year before it was 4%, the year before that it was just over 2%. It's extraordinary change. There's one and a half million barrels of oil not being sold because of those electric vehicles. And we're, we're accelerating with that. So you can see the end of the internal combustion engine, it's the next 10 years or so, we'll see an incredible switch towards, uh, towards EVs. The first trillion watts of solar taking 70 years, the second trillion watts, a solar panel for every man, woman and child, just four more years, hugely exciting. After a century where we were reliant on fossil fuels that were hugely enabling for many, but hugely polluting, we now got clean energy and we've got five billion years of sun reserves. And the shift away with food and ag as well, I mean, we're illogical in the way we feed the world at the moment. You know, 80% of agricultural land is livestock. We feed more human edible protein to them than we get back. And it's 20% of greenhouse gas emissions. You know, here uh, we've, we've eaten lamb without sheep, uh, beef burgers without cows, chicken without eggs or chickens involved. There's an extraordinary change in this. And, you know, it may be hard to change the power system, but changing your diet, you can do it one mouthful at a time. There are many companies that probably haven't even started yet. They haven't really thought through what does a transition plan look like for me? How should they approach it? Every industry thinks they're unique. Every industry thinks they deliver special economic benefits to society and should be given some sort of pass. So if everybody's unique, kind of nobody is. So you have to say, okay, we've got our own special challenges, but there are challenges and we have to own them. So you have to try and adopt the mindset, embrace change and unlock opportunity. So you think, okay, we're gonna future-proof our business. We're gonna use this to drive innovation, reconnect with customers in different ways, find ways of driving new efficiencies. So you embrace it as an, uh, to unlock opportunity and create value. This is not just uh, a, a cost on the business. From a skills point of view, you may need to bring in specialist talent around it. 
you may need to just build partners with others, look at your industrial partners within this, or can it, is it something that you can internalize with the team you have? So it's not necessary that every company in the world has to have a chief sustainability officer, but you have to have the understanding in the business. But the key thing is that, you know, embrace change, unlock opportunity. If you sort of ignore change, you, just, you are going to get rolled over at some point on this, this big. You're going to lose market share, lose license to operate. It sounds very negative to say that, but that's true. And you can see it. All other changes have shown that to be true. What keeps you very optimistic in this space? What, what is it that you'd share? I held two thoughts in my mind. We have to remember now that this climate in particular, but I would say also the tremendous decline in nature. So we've more than halved nature and we risk locking ourselves into more than halved nature again, catastrophic consequences. And on climate, we've got seven or eight years of carbon budget left before we've blown the carbon budget for one and a half degrees. We could easily lock ourselves into going over two degrees. And it's, those are about today's investment decisions. So you have to sort of on one level think, actually it's on our watch, it's our decisions as business leaders, as investors, as individuals, it's our decisions that count and are creating the future. The flip side is to think, wow, you know, we could be the generations that um, unlock incredible new technologies that end pollution, end global warming, that are stewards of the earth, that reverse the decline in nature, uh, that look at a world that's more magical when we left it than when we came into it. And, you know, I, I find that pretty motivating. Steve, thank you so much for joining me today. I really look forward to working together more closely with you and with the Tomasic team on our journey to net zero. Thank you for joining us. Please continue to look out for more episodes of Industries in Transition Meet the CSO series on sc.com.